So hello, yeah, it's me again, Dani Lopez, full stack developer in Salsita. <clears throat> and today I will talk about the explore versus exploit conundrum and what the multi-arm bandit problem can teach us about decision making and life. First, let's imagine it's Friday evening. Let's assume, you know, it's before the pandemic and your best friend suggested going out, but a new person that you just met invited you to a party and he seems quite cool. What to do? And choosing maybe is hard, so just maybe just you'll go home, like you'll go for dinner on your own. But where to go? Your favorite restaurant or the new place everyone's talking about that you've never been to yet? Ah, decisions, decisions. Maybe you should just stay at home and watch some Netflix. But what to watch? The new season of the series you've been binge watching or like a completely new series with a great premise? Ah, okay, forget Netflix, maybe let's just listen to some music. But your favorite band or a new one with a catchy, new catchy song that you just liked? Well, what do all this, the, these decisions have in common? First of all, you have to choose one or the other, at least for this time. Like you cannot have dinner in two restaurants at once. You can of course have dinner in one and then in the other, which is also something that both decisions, all of these decisions have in common. And you know, you can even have dinner on two restaurants on the same day if you really want. But the options are mutually exclusive. The other thing that they have in common is that there's a trade-off be between two goals. You can exploit your knowledge of what's good, so meet you with your best friend, watch your favorite series, and you know you will enjoy it. Or you can explore something new. If you do that, you're taking a risk, because maybe it sucks. Maybe this guy you just met isn't as cool as he seemed on first impression. Maybe the new series is not, it's just not for you. <clears throat> so why would you ever take the risk and explore then? Well, at some point, if you think you can remember the past, your best friend was a stranger and you used to have a different favorite band before you started listening to the one that you now love. If you hadn't explored, you wouldn't have found those. So by exploring, you take the risk of finding out that the new option is just bad. <clears throat> but that's the only way to discover an option that's better than the best option that you knew before. So, you know, I, what to do? Like, how much should you explore? When should you, when should you exploit? What a conundrum. Like, I wish there was a solution that optimized the value you get. Turns out there is, and it's even computable in some cases. You might be wondering if this matters. Like, can't you just do whatever you want and not think about it? Like, what, are you telling me you don't want to optimize every single aspect of your existence? What's wrong with you? Like, no, of course you can do whatever you want. Like, and if you don't discover a great band because you're listening to the, your favorite one, it's not a big deal. But there are situations where finding the optimal answer is important. Like we'll talk about them in a bit more detail later, but this has applications, for example, on website optimization. Like should we use the new cool design or the old one? How many times should we show the users a design to decide if it's better than another one? Or in medical treatments? Like what if there's a treatment for a disease that looks like it might be better than the current one? How much should we try it? Is it ethical to use the one that's known to be worse just to find out like how much worse it is or if it has a chance to be better, if that can lead to people actually dying? Or maybe company strategy, should a company explore a new promising avenue or keep doing what they do best? So we'll talk about situations when there are multiple competing options, each of them has some uncertainty in its payoff that is not known. And the only way to figure out what the payoff looks like is to try actually the options. And of course we can try multiple times, but only one after the other, not in parallel. And we can learn actually, you know, what is the distribution like from one of the trials, you can learn for the next trial and use that information. And of course, what we want is to get the maximum gains over time. A good analogy for all those properties above is a slot machine. A slot machine has in theory unknown payoffs, which you can learn about by playing it and you can try it many times. And your goal is to optimize the total amount of money you make. Uh, of course, if there's a single machine, there's not much to think about, either you play it or not. What makes the problem interesting is when there are multiple machines, <clears throat> each with different payoffs, in theory. So this fulfills the criteria in an intuitive way. So a slot machine in the street lang, it's called a one-arm bandit. It's called one-armed because it has one arm, picture here on the right. And it's probably called bandit because it's very good at quickly depriving people of their, of their cash. Uh, so in the problem, we are facing multiple slot machines and trying to figure out which one gives the best payoff so that we can exploit it. Uh, so multiple one-arm bandits give the name to the problem, the multi-arm bandit. 
And there are many variations, but we will go with the simplest one. So in it, we have, like in this case, four, but n slot machines. And each of they all give the same payoff. But each of them has a fixed probability to do that. So otherwise, it doesn't pay anything. So in this example, the first machine will pay off 35% of times. And we will call that win if it pays off. And the rest of times, it will pay nothing. We will call that losing. <clears throat> of course, in this particular example, the optimal solution is to go to the last machine and pull it all the time. But the whole point is that we don't know the percentages ahead of time. The only way to know them is to pull some arms and infer the percentages from the, from the result to get. <clears throat> Imagine that we've done that a few times. We've got some results. So which is the best machine to pull? In this example, we have two of them. The red machine has a better track record. It pays 60% of the time. Well, the blue machine only pays off 50% of the time. Uh, this is a similar case as the, all the examples that I've given before with the best friend and the, compared to the cool stranger and so on. There is one option that is better known, like we've pulled the red machine 15 times, and it seems to give better results, better expected value, and an option that seems to be a bit worse because it has only 50% compared to the 60 of the, of the other one, but it has barely been explored. So it's hard to tell what the exact probability of the blue machine is. So the red machine represents exploit, go for the best option that we know of. The blue machine represents explore, go for the less known option because it seems it could be better. So what's the best option in this case? There is a clear answer. I'll give you a minute to think about it. You can write it in the chat if you like. I'll be just here, don't mind me. I'll be looking through the window a bit. Like, it's amazing how all the snow melted in just a couple of days. Like, it's even the, the floor is dry, it's not even muddy or anything. It's quite good. Did anyone write something in the chat? Griffin says, Blue, you were in the dry run, you cannot answer. Oh, oh well. No more answers. Okay. So the answer is it depends. Yeah, sorry, I tricked you. It does really depend. It depends on how many more times you intend to play the, the machines. So suppose it's your last pool before going home. In that case, you should exploit. Given the information that you have, the red machine is the most likely to pay off. So you should pull that one. There is no point in exploring, because even if the blue machine happened to pay off 99% of times and you were just really unlucky with your two pulls, well, you won't have any further chances to exploit it. So with the information you have at this point, the red machine is just better. But what if you plan to play 100 more times? Then, at least intuitively, exploring the blue machine at least a bit more makes more sense, because its expected value is 50%, but it's based on very little data. Like this result could have easily been produced by a machine that pays off 30% of the time or 70% of the time. Let's look at the probability distributions for this, these values. So here we see that the range of values that we expect for each of these variables. We expect the red machine to pay around 60% of the times. And this is a relatively high certainty. Like the probability distribution is very close to the center because we've pulled it 15 times. We expect the blue machine to pay off around 50% of the times, but there we're just a lot less certain because two pulls just don't tell you that much. And this is represented by a wider uh, possible range of values. There's a reasonable chance that the blue machine is better than the red one. It could still fall in this area. So if you plan to pull 100 times, it makes sense to try out the blue machine for a few more pulls to get a more accurate estimate of its real value even if it might not be as good as the, as, the red, as the red one, it might be much better. So if it is, you'll have plenty of chances to exploit that. So, and yeah, if you plan to just pull one more time, just go for the red machine. It seems to be better for, with the information you have. But <clears throat> what if instead of one more pull or 100 more, you have 10 more pulls? Like what is the optimal strategy? Is it still worth exploring the blue machine what if you explore it and the next pool is a loss? Like if you have only 10 more pools, you have to be careful. Like you, you need to optimize to get the gain as, as you need to be able to exploit as well as, as explore. So yeah, what if the next pool is a loss? Should you continue pulling it or switch back to the red one? And if so, how many times do you need to fail until you decide it's worse? And as I said, there is an optimal general solution that tells us when we should pull each, mach each machine. Uh, let's talk about it. Intuitively, 
just using the expected value is not enough because there might be a better option that has lower expected value, but it's because it hasn't been yet explored and the you know, lower amount of data just gives it a lower, you know, you were unlucky, let's say, basically with the blue machine, we don't know. So intuitively, again, the best strategy would be to explore in the beginning until you find out what's actually the best machine and then stick to it. But how much should you explore? Because it can take a lot of pulls to make sure that the machine is really better than another. And there is a cost to exploring. Every time that you don't pull from the best machine because you are exploring, you are losing money. Of course, there is also a cost of ex stopping exploration too early. You could end up exploiting a machine that's not the best one and again, losing money. It's actually a difficult problem. Like there is no trivial solution to this that you can come up with in five minutes. Uh, for a bit of historical perspective, this was very popular. It gathered a lot of interest during World War II from allied scientists, and it was taking up a lot of their mental energy and effort. And according to Peter Whittle, who was one of the guys researching this, it was suggested that they should just drop the problem over Germany as the ultimate in instrument of intellectual sabotage. So, yeah. Anyway, many strategies were suggested. We were good strategies, but none of them were optimal. In the end, it took until 1979 for the optimal solution to be found. And what it does, it is assigns a value to each machine based on the results that it got. So machines with better results have better values, but machines that are less explored also get better values because they have the potential of being better than machines that are more known. And so, yeah, the optimal strategy is to pull the machine with the highest value. We will see a table with the value soon. And yeah, I said it's the optimal solution, but I should probably say it's an optimal solution because it relies on a certain assumption that's called geometric discounting. So in real life problems, <clears throat> let's go like to, to geometric discounting. That, that means, yeah, in real life, it's better to have a thousand dollars now than to have a thousand dollars in a month because you can do things with them now you can invest them there's inflation so maybe they lose value and so on similarly if you're trying to discover a new medicine discovering it now is better than discovering discovering it in 10 years so in the same way this Gittins index uses that to model the fact that your last pool is only worth what you get from it but your first pool is worth what you get from it plus the information that you learn that you can use in subsequent pools so there's this discounting value that you have to choose. And this discounting value is the answer to this question. How much is a win on the next pool worth to you compared to a win now? And the answer is should be a number between zero and one, which multiplies the values for the next steps. So in these examples, if the first pool is worth 100 and you have 0 0.9 discounting, you multiply it and the second pool is worth 90 and the third pool is 90 multiplied by 0 0.9, which is 81 and so on and so forth. And as I said, this is the number you have to choose if you want to calculate the Gittins index. So how to choose this number? It's the same answer as before, actually. It depends. It depends on how many pulls you expect to make. So in the first case here, with 0 0.9 discounting, you're saying that a good result now would be great. It would be worth 100. But if it comes a bit later, it's still quite useful. If it comes five steps from now, it's still worth 65, which is quite fine. So you're probably planning to play the game for longer time. In the second case, you really want to get the benefit now or really soon because like just a few, few pulls further, the value goes really, really low. So this means that you're looking at a shorter term strategy where well, you'll just be doing very few pulls. This is the table for the Gittins indices for 0 0.9 discounting based on the number of wins and losses. I mark the blue and red machines here for you. Notice how the blue machine has a very slightly higher Gittins index than the red one, even if it has a lower expected value. Again, it's 50% versus 60%. <clears throat> and as I said, the optimal strategy is to choose the machine with the higher Gittins index. So in this case, we will choose the blue machine, then update based on the result that we get from it. And then you know, keep updating. Every time we pull an arm, we get a result. And we update the indices and pull the best arm in the, in the, <clears throat> the, the, the table indicates you basically. So suppose we did that and we won. We move this to the right, two wins, one loss. And now we get an index of 0 0.7. Okay, then we would pull the blue machine again. So suppose that we lost. <clears throat> okay, then we are at 0 0.6. So now the best machine to pull is the, 
is the red machine again. And then you pull it and you would go on, so on and so forth. And notice how if a machine is ever the best one and it wins, the number will only increase. Like advancing towards the right in this table means that the value increases. Uh, not necessarily after a loss. If a machine was really good and it lost, it, it will be worse, but it might still be the best machine. Interestingly, for this case, a machine that has no known track record, so it's zero wins, zero losses, you have no idea, has an index that is around 0 0.7. That's the same index that you'd get from a machine that has a lot of pulls, and 70% of them were wins. <clears throat> Notice as well, like, how the more information you have, the more the value converges towards the expected value. So all cells in this diagonal <clears throat> have the same amount of wins than of losses. So the expected value is 0 0.5. With little information, the optimal strategy is to be optimistic. It's 0 0.7 if you have no idea, but it's still 0 .0 0 0.6 if you have made two pulls and it's 50%. But the closer you get to <clears throat> Or the more information you gather, the closer you get to the 0 0.5, because you know you have to, you know, no more reason to believe, you know, to be optimistic. You have to believe that your data matches reality, and you know, as the wise man once said, "Reality hits you hard, bro." <clears throat> this strategy has some limitations. So it has it makes some assumptions. It's a simplification of the data. It assumes that the payoffs are static during the whole process, which you know if, if it's a slot machine, it might be true, but in reality, it might not. Things change. Like website might be better, you know, today, or the taste of people change, or the medicine, you know, there's a new discoveries and so on and so forth. So yeah, in this version, it also assumes that either you win or lose. But it, you know, in reality, sometimes you get a thousand dollars, and sometimes you get a million dollars, and it's a different experience. Not that I've experienced getting a million dollars, but oh well. And it also doesn't take into account that the cost of switching from one option to another might exist. Like you can just freely go from one and then another and one and then another. And also, it requires this geometric discounting parameter, which you might not, you know, be easily come up with that, and it doesn't match how the people think about these future gains, according to psychology research. Also, the algorithm is computationally quite costly. So if you were expecting me to give you an algorithm that would make all decisions for you, sorry to disappoint you. But it doesn't mean it's useless. It's still a useful simplification of reality. Even if we don't need the optimal solution for a complex real life problem, or if we cannot compute it, it's still useful to think about a simplified ver version of it and use it as an approximation to solve the real, the real one. I mean, for example, physics, it's still useful, even if cows are not always perfectly spherical floating in a gravityless vacuum. So we can take what we learn from the optimal solution and still use it as a guideline and adapt it to the more complex situation or the different situation. <clears throat> so what did we learn from the solution? The first lesson is that Exploring or exploiting depends on where you are in the interval. If you're at the beginning, you should explore more. If you're at the end, exploring is not going to be worth it as much, so you should tend to exploit. Seeing it from an information perspective, when you have limited information, explore when you are confident enough, exploit. That's nothing new. What's more interesting is that you should really be optimistic in the face of uncertainty. If you don't know how good something is, you should try it because it might turn out to be great. Conversely, once you have enough indications that something is unlikely to be as good as the other options, just drop it fast and never look back. And you know, if ever a choice is the best one and you pull it and you win, it will just have become better, so it will remain the best. So how to adapt this to you know more complex problem? You know, if payoffs change over time, you should be exploring more frequently because you know you want to make sure that you discover any solutions that might have become better than what you know best. Also, you should give more weight to the recent pulls because like older pulls are probably less accurate than pulls that, pulls that you did recently. Supposing that things don't change completely randomly over time, like they evolve in some directions. And if payoffs are not you know, simple zero to one, you just, instead of modeling the plane probability, you will have a probability distribution of outcomes for each machine, and you can do the same. Or maybe you can just look up multi-arm bandit problems and look for a variant that most closely matches your problem. There's like dozens of them. 
like for example, if payoff chain payoff all, all this this these two that I mentioned are known and studied very uh, thoroughly. Let's go to <clears throat> real life applications. So there was a new treatment for a respiratory failure. It was called ECMO, and it seemed to be particularly promising on children. It relied on pumping their blood out and oxygenating it out of the body and putting it back there again, which was like, you know, a bit radical. But as you know, if you don't breathe, you die. So it's a quite a serious condition. Anyway, in the 80s, some scientists wanted to explore this treatment, but they found it unethical to follow the usual traditional experiment designs, because traditional experiment designs are focused on exploring. You have a lot of some people, you give half of them treatment A, half, half of them treatment B, or maybe there's, you know, divided in three and there's a placebo and there maybe there might be more treatments, it doesn't matter. But yeah, and then you see how it performs. And at the end, you look up in which group of people, fewer people died and declare that's the best treatment. That works, but it has a disadvantage that, well, people die. And they could have been saved if they had been using the better treatment. And probably you had some idea of what the better treatment was as the, as the experiment was evolving. So again, explore versus exploit. What can we do? Like we can try both treatments, but as soon as you have some data, use that data to favor the most promising treatment. For example, using the Gittins index or some other algorithms that I'll mention later that are a bit more practical. And that's what the scientists did after a few months, because you know you, you, you cannot just gather a lot of people with this thing, it's, it's, just, it's, it's a longer process. So after a few months, they treated three children with the traditional treatment and 17 children with ECMO and all the people, all the children which were treated with the traditional treatment died, and all the children which were, tra were treated with ECMO survived. And that's why they treated a lot more with ECMO because they felt like they saw that it was working and much better than the traditional treatment. Uh, this turned out not to be enough for the public health officials because, you know, they didn't want to change the, they, they didn't think there was enough data essentially. So, and the result, Several more experiments were needed. Several children died that would have been saved by using the more promising treatment. And partially thanks to this story and similar cases, adaptive trials are now more accepted in cases where it's considered unethical not to give someone a treatment that has some evidence that proves it, it's better. So another obvious example is A-B testing. So for whoever doesn't know, A-B testing is a technique that you can use to decide which version of a website is better or some other things, but it's very commonly used in websites. So suppose you want to sell a product. You set up two sites. One of them, the buy button is blue, and, and another one is red. Then you randomly serve this version to each visitor. Then you figure out which one is best and use it. The problem is that you need enough data for it to be statistically significant. So if you do it with half a dozen people, it's very possible that you'll reach the wrong conclusion. But if you do it with thousands of people, you're losing money each time you're not serving the best version. You're not exploiting the information that you learned. Oh, the old explore versus exploit trade-off again. What? I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. So what can we do with what we learned? We can treat it as a multi-arm bandit problem. Each site or each version of the site is a machine. We can gather the statistics live and serve the most promising version to visitors as we learn what is the prom most promising version. We can use again the Gittins index or some other algorithms, and we can balance exploration <clears throat> versus exploitation according to how many visitors we expect to get or how long term we expect the site to be live. So for a one-off event, say a Black Friday discount, like we would favor exploiting more and for a website redesign that will last months or years, we can afford to explore more to make sure that we end up finding the best possible solution. Okay, that's good, but what if you actually want to calculate these values or implement this program to decide what website to show each visitor? As I said, getting things is complex and costly, but there are several simple alternatives which perform well. The simplest one, or beyond just picking at random, is just to pick the option with the best expected reward. So in the example from before, red machine has 0 point or 60%, blue machine has 50%, so we will go with the red and that's it. And we'll keep pulling it and we'll keep updating it. So, <clears throat> and it's possible that the red machine becomes worse than the blue one, and then we will start pulling the blue one. But we will never explore any other machine that's not the best otherwise. 
this is not great because you know we barely explored the, the blue one as we mentioned. So we really are not that sure that it's fifty percent. And um, but in, in this strategy will never explore it again unless their best option falls underneath it. A way to mitigate that is to use the same algorithm, but a fixed percentage of times, just choose a random arm. So in the same case, we will pick the red arm, let's say 95% of the times, but the rest of the times we will choose at random. This will give us a chance to eventually pull the blue one and explore it. And if the blue one becomes better after exploring it, this 5% of the times, or the red one becomes worse because it happened that it was not really 60%, we will, switch to, we will switch to the blue one, and then we will be pulling the blue one 95% of the times, and 5% of the times we will do the random one. <clears throat> and this also allows us to tweak the parameter, which can be useful, as I said, for, you know, depends on your, how long your strategy is. So if you want to explore more, we will choose a random option more times. Let's say 20% of the time it will be random. And if we want to exploit more, maybe only 1% of the times we will do random. And this actually is not bad, it performs like quite well, but we could probably do better because <clears throat> imagine after a lot of pulls, we end up in this situation. We've explored a lot. We figured out that the blue machine is around 80% and it's really, really unlikely that the red one is better. But given this algorithm, we will still, we will pull the blue machine like 95% of times or whatever, but we will still spend some fixed percentage of values pulling the machine that has just no way to, to be better than the, than the best one. There's like ways to to fix that, but let's move to a different kind of, of algorithm. What, what we really care about is finding the best machine. So what if we calculate the confidence intervals and pick the one that has the highest maximum? This way it's going to be difficult to miss the, the best machine. It would look something like this. We are 95% sure that the blue one is between 10% and 90%. And we are again 95% sure that the red machine is between these two red bars, like 46 and 74. So if we want to make sure that we don't miss a machine that would have a great payoff, we should explore the blue one because our most optimistic estimates say that the blue one in the best case is gonna be better than the best case for the red one. And this is actually similar to how the Gittins index works a bit. So the less you have explored an option, the wider the interval it will be. So using this algorithm, you'll be more optimistic about it. But if it proves to be bad, you will soon discard it because it will, you know, center towards uh, towards the left. And but yes, as long as there is a reasonable chance it's better than the best option, you know, it's still worth exploring. And again, this can be adjusted. If you want to explore more, you can choose a bigger confidence interval and be more optimistic. And if you want to exploit more, you can choose a smaller one and be closer to the expected value. And this way, if we ever end up in a case like the previous example, we'll no longer choose the red one ever again, unless it really, you know, no, it, it, it's not going to happen in this case, because we established that it, it just cannot be better than the blue one. And another way to do this is just to sample each distribution randomly and then pull the one that has the best payoff. Let's see an example here. So for the blue machine, we'll pick any value at random from the whole distribution based on the probability, of course. So in the most cases, it will be near the center because that's where the probability mass is concentrated. And in the red case, the, the probability mass is concentrated much more in the center. So we will really be pull, you know, more likely to, to pick a value of near the center. And yeah, then we will compare them and choose the best one and pull from that machine and update the distributions, of course, again, based on the result. So in this case, the red value is greater. So we would pull this one, but we could have easily ended up picking those values. This would be a likely outcome of this random picking, in which case we would pull the blue machine and we would get more information about it. Let's talk about regret. That's the difference between what would have been best to do and what you actually did. In real life regret, well, I don't want to bring up anyone's traumatic past, so let's keep it to the bandit problem, okay? In the multi-arm bandit problem, the best possible thing to do is to know from the beginning what is the best arm and pull it all the times. Since we don't have that knowledge, we unfortunately have to spend some time and some effort exploring to find out, and we are exploring machines that are probably not as good, but they might be. And the more we explore, the more we will be pulling suboptimal machines, 
But if again, if we don't explore enough, we might end up exploiting something that's not the best. So unfortunately, it happens that regret always grows, or at best, stays the same. But it never decreases. The thing is that a good strategy will make it grow slower over time, and it will allow us to reach the best machine in which the regret no longer increases at all sooner. This is a graph of how regret would increase for each of those algorithms, given some case. Uh, the green line represents which choosing at random. So regret grows essentially linearly, because we are exploring a lot. We're exploring the machines all the time. But we're not using of what we, are, we have learned from it, and we never exploit. Uh, the blue line here is the upper confidence bound strategy. So here we see that the regret, the regret grows quite a bit in the beginning. But then it stabilizes once we have like good information on the machines. The yellow one is epsilon greedy. <clears throat> uh, it seems that it identified the actual best machine really early, because it's not growing here in the beginning. Um, but since it's condemned to try at random every once in a while, it will always keep increasing the regret slightly over time. It's also linear, but with a much, much smaller slope, depending on the epsilon parameter. And <clears throat> the red one is the Thomson sampling. And it seems that it identified the best machine very, very early. <clears throat> and it kept exploding it, essentially. At and around halfway here, the curve is <clears throat> almost completely flat because it's only exploiting the, the best machine. <clears throat> so <clears throat> can the multi arm bandit problem teach us something else about life? You bet. Pun intended. Get it? Because we're talking about randomness and <clears throat> slot machines. So it's like betting. You bet. Haha. Uh -huh. Very funny. Uh, so yeah, it makes sense of human life. In early years, during childhood, children explore. So they don't have to be worried about making optimal choices. They just rely on their caretakers to survive. They, they're really bad at exploiting. If you don't feed a small child, they will not even feed themselves. They, they will actually cry a lot until you feed them, but that's, a, that's another, another thing. But you know, they're built to be curious and try new things. They are explorers by nature. But the older people get, the more they exploit. Like the elderly have hopefully explored a lot during their lifetimes, so they have a good idea of what's good and what's not, what they like and what they don't like. And they also know that they have limited chances to do things. So at that point, exploring some newer options is not worth it as much. And yeah, there was an experiment to figure out what lies behind the preferences of people when choosing who to spend time with. People were asked who they'd rather spend time with, a family member that they were close with, or an artist they like. And there were many other options, but they are on, along the same line, so we'll keep it simple. As you might expect, older people prefer the family member, which would correspond to exploit, because it's a known good option. Younger people prefer the artist, which corresponded to explore, because it's a known, less known, more higher potential option in theory. Yeah. Nothing new. I mean, probably old people just are more disengaged in society. They don't feel like putting the effort and so on. But really, is that the case? As part of the experiment, old people were told to imagine there was a medical breakthrough that would allow them to live 20 years longer. Given that, their preferences were in undistinguishable from the young people's preferences. They did prefer the, the artist, which is the exploration option in this case. And on the contrary, when young people were told to imagine they would be moving to a city like on a different country soon, they preferred to meet the family member. So they prefer they prefer to exploit because they thought that they would be you know they wouldn't have many more chances to exploit this you know good known uh, relation. So this means these sorts of decisions aren't really based on people's actual age but instead they are based on where people are in their interval. So how many more pulls they are expecting to make. What about Salsita? As usual, some thoughts on how this affects us. Hopefully we would like the company to survive long. And if so, considering that the payoffs in the real world are not static, we should spend some effort in exploring like all the time. <clears throat> Uh, someone was asking in an AMA not long ago, like, is it too risky to explore this new positioning? I'm paraphrasing here. I think they didn't use the word explore. 
But yeah, I'd, I'd say, isn't it too risky to keep exploiting the current position without looking for alternatives, considering that it might be giving us slowly diminishing returns? So yeah, uh, I, I'm convinced keeping doing business as usual is not the optimal arm to pull. I'm not saying that I know what is the best arm to pull, but I think we should explore and find it. We should be constantly exploring and because the real world is changing all the time. And I'm not saying we should spend a huge amount of resources trying to find the next holy grail because we should still be mostly exploiting because we have a good track record. We know what is working and it's still working quite well. But I'm just saying that we should always be spending some effort on exploring new promising avenues. Also, if they don't give the best results in a reasonable time scale, we should not hesitate to drop them and try something else. And this way, that's the only way that we will minimize our regret. We will minimize the you know, great opportunities that we miss. <clears throat> in a smaller scale per project, like the ideal is to explore a lot in the beginning. Like that's why we do design sprints, but you know, design sprint only helps you figure out what you are building. Ideally, we would apply the same philosophy to other aspects of the project. I think the shape up methodology is also encouraging that and it could be helpful, though I don't have direct experience with it. But we should spend time in the beginning exploring the pieces that are less known, like maybe looking into a new technology we're not familiar with, maybe a new process. So we can only not only learn from it, but also in the end deliver a better solution. Of course, the problem here is that doing that takes time and effort and Clients are very often very exploit oriented. They want solutions delivered as soon as possible with the minimum cost possible. So they want us to do what we are good at and to know what we are doing. So exploit the, our existing experience, which is understandable. But as I said, you know, new technologies are coming all the time and so on. So we still should spend some time exploring it. So yeah, here the conundrum is more about getting them to understand this and reaching an agreement regarding explore versus exploit than our own decision. Because I think if, if it was up to us, we would all be exploring most of the time and always getting to the optimal solution and creating amazing, beautiful products. But you know, real life is not like that. Now you also have to deliver. And yeah. This is basically all I have to say. This presentation was heavily inspired in this book. It's called Algorithms to Live By. It has one chapter fully dedicated to the multi-arm bandit problem, but it also has other interesting chapters. It talks, for example, about caching, base rule, overfitting, and other things. I can recommend it to anyone. And yeah, having reached this point, are there any questions? Oh, I, I should be the one who is looking at it there are there are are you going to do it or should i share my screen for oh you? i i i can do that okay um, uh, no, no wait a second here it is so whatever my choice i always feel like i missed out on the better option when faced with choosing the dish i love or something else that looks good on the menu. Yeah, like that's the thing. Like, is it, that's maybe something that's called buyer's regret. You buy something and then you think it was not the best choice. That's a different topic. But if you think about it, is it the best? You know, did you choose the best option or did you not? Because, you know, if you regret your choice, you can always go back to the same restaurant again and pick the choice that you didn't like. Or like that you didn't pick that looked better in the menu afterwards, after you picked the, the different one. So and you can see which is the actual like real, you know, value of the choice because if if it's something that you didn't like, or like that that you thought was better because it was actually better, or it's just like this buyer's regret that you regretted the changing when like, you regretted the choice just after you you made it. So yeah, try it the next time and you will see. How do you find such relevant and inter entertaining topics? So, uh, as I said, this one came from a book. So, option one, read books. Uh, <clears throat> I would say basically, you know, explore. Uh, look around, read books, listen to podcasts, read article blogs, and it's once you find uh, something interesting that, you know, 
sometimes it's like, hey, I, I could speak about this, and I just I just do it. And you don't have to be an expert on the topic. I'm not an expert on this. I just read it on the book. I learned a bit more about it. I thought about you know how this applies to to Salsita or how it's a good way way to uh, like to present it so that it's interesting for you. And then just just did it. Hey, don't move it. Okay. Huh. Nice. Uh, so what about situations when exploring makes it impossible to ever again return back to and exploit the current option, leaving your wife or somebody else? Yeah, then this is not a multi-arm bandit problem because like, you know, you cannot, it, it, it relies on the assumption that you can pull multiple times. In this case, or you could say it's a multi-arm bandit problem, but you are on your last pull. So if, you, you you should consider what's your relationship with your wife and what's your relationship with this other person that you are considering leaving her for and basically exploit. If you have a good relationship with your wife, then stay with her. If you think it's gonna be better with this other person, well, it's your last pull. You can try to, you, you can just leave her. Uh, whatever my, ch uh, why is it not being deleted? Okay, whatever. Have you heard of simulated annealing algorithm? I think the philosophy behind the algorithm is more fitting to real life. Yeah, I, I've heard about it. I think I might have even implemented it 10 years ago. Uh, like I think that's basically when you have a lot of possible, you know, big sp space to explore, like combinatoric space to explore, and you're just trying to optimize certain uh, parameters on that. And it's not sequential, you just basically have a solution. Here, the, the, the interesting part of the multi-arm bandit is that you pull an arm, and then you learn from it, and then you do something else. And it's not a very complex, uh, <clears throat> it's not a very, you know, complex uh, state that you're modeling. It's like you have several machines, you have to choose which one to pull. So I think it's it's solving a slightly different problem. It's uh, It might be more fitting to real life, that's a good point. But yeah, it, 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 I would say it's solving a different problem. Can I borrow your book? It was an audio book, actually. I, I listened to it. I lied to you, I said I read it. But yeah, I can send it to you, I guess. I don't know, I can tell you where to buy it. Uh, maximizer satisfies and their satisfaction with and preferences for reversible versus irreversible decisions. Interesting paper on buyer's regret topic. Mm -hmm. I might read it later on. And maybe, Martin, you can do a presentation about it. Uh, people don't approach the multi arm bandit problem the same. Some live for risk and some really hate it. Yeah, that's, that's another thing. Like you, you can choose how much risk you are willing to take. And if you want to actually do the optimal solution, like where, you know, you balance perfectly exploration and exploitation, and you're always picking the same, like the best machine, given the current knowledge of all the states of the machines. Yeah, you should be using an, you know, Gittins index or some other algorithm to do that. But yeah, in real life, you can just, adjust to whatever your you know situation is like and if you are more risk averse or more you know risk prone okay so i think that was it thanks everyone for joining me and i guess see you in the next brown back <laughs>